Well, good morning, church family, and happy summer. We had uh, kind of a beautiful day yesterday in in the midst of a lot of rain lately, but uh, one of the things that my family really enjoys about summer is being able to take little quick trips here and there, little overnighters. And about three weeks ago, we went down to Hershey, Pennsylvania for the first time. And if you've never been to Hershey Park, uh, it was amazing. They have about 14 roller coasters that are all just awesome. We enjoyed that. And uh, we got to see all of the chocolate stuff and, of course, sample that. And uh, one of the things we did while we were down there was my wife, Amy, found uh, a ropes course that we were able to go on. And so we did that as a family, all three of our kids. And we've got a a 19, 16-year-old and six-year-old, so big range. And uh, that was a lot of fun, but a bit challenging. And our our youngest daughter, Leah, you can see her in the picture here. Uh, There was this one point where she was on this uh, pretty challenging part of the the ropes course, and she got a little bit stuck, needed some help, and uh, there were a couple tears there. But, but she did it. She made it to the, the other end, to the platform. And when she got there, we were all cheering for her. And uh, she was a little upset with herself because she got scared doing this. And it was just a great lesson to teach her that being brave is doing something even if you're afraid. And so uh, great lesson for her. And that's kind of one of the things that we're learning in this series with First Peter is that we often face challenging things. We're learning about growth under pressure. And if you remember uh, the very first message that started off this series, Jonathan spoke about suffering. And uh, if you're able to hear that, it's a great message. Uh, Maybe you missed it. Uh, Maybe you're one of those people who you're like, I love me a good message about suffering. Can't get enough suffering. Uh, Good news, we're talking about suffering again today. So uh, Peter actually talks about suffering. And so uh, in chapter three here, he cycles back to suffering, but he he talks about suffering in a way where he really kind of ups the ante. And um, the thing is, when when we talk about suffering, nobody chooses to suffer, right? None of us would choose that. Nobody would choose to lose a parent a loved one, no one would choose to lose a child. Nobody would choose to get a diagnosis of cancer or to have your marriage go down a path where it feels like the only option you have is separation or divorce. No one would choose to go through a, marriage, through a, a miscarriage. And these are, these are things, this type of suffering that we would avoid at all cost. And then Peter comes along and he actually challenges us to choose to suffer. That's right, the very thing that we would avoid at all costs, Peter challenges us uh, to suffer. And he says there's a type of suffering that we actually have a choice in. And he calls us to choose to suffer. So we're gonna dive into the text this morning and we're gonna see why in the world Peter would call us to do that and what makes this type of suffering so unique. And so before we read the scripture, I wanna give you two Bible hacks that are kind of helpful for me when I read. Uh, the first thing is, uh, if I have the chance, if I'm in a place where I can, I'll, I'll read the text out loud. And that just helps me because uh, if I read it in my head, my mind tends to wander and that helps me to stay focused. The second thing that I'll do is, oftentimes I'll read through the same passage over and over. And what I'll do is, sometimes I'll read it as if I'm the author and sometimes I'll read it as if I'm the audience. And so as I read this, I'm gonna read this as if I'm Peter this morning, and I wanna encourage you to to listen to this as if you are um, the audience receiving this letter from from Peter, someone who walked with Christ, and he's written this letter to. And to give you a little background on the audience, uh, this is a letter that was circulated among multiple church communities, and uh, it was in, in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And many of the Christians that were reading this were facing persecution. And they were being harassed and facing hostility from their Greek and Roman neighbors. And Peter wrote this to encourage them in the midst of their suffering. So here we are, 1 Peter 3, verse 8. 
He says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, he, Peter talks about the type of suffering that comes as a result of living in a broken world, right? This is, this is not heaven. Bad things happen. And God's will is not always carried out here on earth. And now here in chapter three, Peter introduces the suffering that comes from a choice that we make. Now I wanna be clear about the type of suffering that Peter's talking about. Remember, Peter is talking to first century Christians who are facing persecution. And if you remember back to your history classes in high school, the emperor during that time was a man named Nero. And just before this letter was circulated amongst the churches, um, there was this great fire that happened. And this fire, it destroyed mansions and temples and homes. It was devastating. And there was a rumor that Nero started this fire. And we don't know whether or not he did that, but in order to shift the blame from himself, he, he accused Christians of starting this fire. And then Nero began this, let's kill the Christian show, where he arrested and just brutally executed Christians. So this was not a good time or a good place to be a Christian. But Peter comes along and he sets the bar really high and he calls Christians to suffer for doing good. Now, thankfully, we live in a time in, here in the US where not, we're not persecuted like first century Christians were. But we often mistake sacrifice with suffering. Now, uh, just recently, my son Jake, our 16-year-old, uh, he told me he wants to, to kind of get into weightlifting. We've got a little home gym, and he's like, I'd, you know, I'd like to work on that. And so I've been taking some time working with him and teaching him all the basics. And uh, one of the things with weightlifting, it's really important to have a spotter. And I don't know if you know this, but the number one rule with a spotter, if you're spotting someone, and let's say I said, Jake, if, if dad's on the bench and I'm doing something and you're spotting and something tragic happens to me, before you call 911, put as much weight on the bar as you can, okay? <laughs> it's very important that you do that. And uh, but then, so he's learning about that and he's learning that there's things you have to give up in order to do this. You're gonna have to give up your time. You wanna try to eat healthier. So these are things he's learning. And I think we all understand the concept of, of sacrifice. And if you have kids, you understand giving up things to, to bless your kids. But suffering for doing good is different from sacrifice. And I wanna define the two. So sacrifice is giving up something now so that myself or someone I love can benefit. That's sacrifice. Suffering for good is experiencing pain or giving up something so that my enemies can benefit. That's the way Peter describes it. So why would someone want to do this? Peter explains something to us that, that doesn't seem to make sense, and he, he drops this radical concept on us. And this is what Peter says. He says, suffering is not the opposite of blessing. Suffering is not 
the opposite of blessing. He actually says that blessing can go hand in hand with suffering. So what is this blessing that Peter's talking about? And Peter reveals two things that we receive when we're blessed. And the first we see in verses 10 through 12. And here Peter is quoting Psalm 34. This is a Psalm about blessing. And it says, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. And then he says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. And so the first thing we receive is the attention of God. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. The Lord notices. He is actually attentive to your prayer. I don't know if you're like me and you have some times where you're like, God, are you, are you really listening to me? And this is a really strong promise that we have in this Psalm. One of my favorite TV series that Amy and I watched was uh, a series called Parenthood. And it's about this extended family and all the stories that they experience. And one of the characters, uh, his name is Zeke, and he's the grandfather in this group. And uh, what I love about him, he never calls his, his grandchildren by their name. He just calls them grandson or granddaughter. It's kind of this cute thing he does. And there's this episode where Zeke and his wife Camille are having some difficulties in their marriage. And so they go, they go to counseling or therapy and Zeke learns this skill that if he's ever being disrespectful, respectful to his wife Camille, or, or if he ever catches himself where he's just not paying attention to her, he stops himself and, and he looks at her and he says, I see you and I hear you. And honestly, that happens in my marriage sometimes. I'll catch myself where I'm, I'm not listening to Amy. If she thinks I'm not listening, she'll say something like, she'll drop in, I'm pregnant, just to see if I'm listening. <laughs> and I'll say, I see you and I hear you. <laughs> And that's the promise that this psalm gives, that the Lord sees you and he hears you. And if we keep reading, we discover the second thing that we receive down in verses 13 through 15. Uh, so Peter's, Peter's going through this, he says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for doing right, you are blessed. And then do not fear their threats, don't be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, and he shares this next statement. It seems really disconnected from what he's been talking about. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And it's like, did we, did we start talking about apologetics or something here or evangelism and sharing your faith? Why does he bring this up? And it's because the second thing we receive is the attention of others. When you suffer for doing good, people notice, especially the people who are persecuting you. And the world is used to a system where we repay evil for evil and insult for insult. And Peter calls us to try something different, to repay evil with blessing. And he says, when you do that, people notice. Uh, just a couple years ago, my family was able to take a trip to Disney, which is our favorite vacation spot. And we went with another family we're close with. And this, this happened literally days before COVID, when the country started shutting down and, and days before Disney shut down. And while we were there, um, there was this thing I would do when we were in a group. And um, it's pretty childish. But the reason why I would do it is because it would make my oldest daughter, Hannah, she would, she would laugh hysterically and almost wet her pants. And so what it would look like is, um, is at one point we're on, in line to do the Little Mermaid ride. And before you get on the ride, you, you go through this line and they've designed it to feel like you're underwater. And so it's really dim. There's kind of these moving lights. The, the ground looks like sand. And we get to this part where the room opens up into a much larger area and the line weaves back and forth. So you go down and turn around. It does that a bunch of times. And you can probably fit about 80 or 90 people in here because it's, you know, it's before COVID, you're all packed in. And so I wait till I get to the very middle of the room. And, and here's what you do. As loudly as I possibly can, 
I bellow out just a single syllable, and the, and the syllable doesn't really matter. But what's important is when you do this, you make sure that you don't move your shoulders or your head or anything. You just bellow this out. And, and what happens is the room instantly goes from like this murmur of conversation to dead quiet. People have no idea what just happened and they don't know who did it either. <laughs> and so I did this, dead silent. And, and my daughter's like trying like crazy not to laugh in Peter Pan's. And, and what I didn't notice at the time was behind me, a little bit behind me was there, this person and our family, we've kind of forever nicknamed her the lady in yellow because she was wearing all yellow. She was furious. She was so mad. And I think if she knew who I was, she would have killed me. She probably peed a little bit. And, and she was so angry. And I wanted to make sure that's what, it's so important not to move so she had no idea who did this. And there are some times when we don't want to be noticed. But Peter says, when you suffer for doing good, you can't help but be noticed. You receive the attention of others. Now, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, that's, that's great and all, Peter, but does that mean that we have to just allow any sort of injustice or inconvenience or frustration just to happen? Do we just roll over and allow this? And I don't think that's at all what Peter's suggesting. Peter's not asking us to avoid injustice. Peter is challenging us to fight injustice differently than how our culture fights it. And I think we all know how our culture fights injustice, right? It's a really simple process. We rant. We see this on Facebook. We see this on the media. Basically, anywhere there's a screen available, we can find people who rant about something. And Peter says there's a different way, but it involves suffering. Instead of turning to social media and criticizing who our enemy is and sounding like everyone else in the world, Peter says, try suffering for doing good. Now, what's hard about suffering for doing good is that it often feels like you're not making a difference. You're not having an impact. You don't get the quick results that you would from a, a well-typed post on Facebook. And there's a word in the English language that not a lot of us like, and it's the word patient, right? And especially in Christian uh, circles, we like to joke that if, if you ever want to grow in patience, don't, don't pray for patience because God won't give you patience, right? He'll put you in a situation where you need patience. Um, and there's, a, there's another phrase that the Bible we used instead of the word patience, and it's long suffering. And I am convinced more and more as I go through my faith journey and as I go through life that, that bearing fruit takes time. A key verse for Amy and I for several years now is Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And the thing about suffering for doing good is it takes a lot of patience. It's long-suffering, and it's often tiring. And Amy and I... We don't always get things perfect, but we try really hard to do the, the healthy decisions in our marriage and our relationships and the activities that we do. And it's honestly oftentimes tiring. And it can feel like there's no fruit for a while, but all of a sudden something will pop up and someone will just give us a word of encouragement and they'll say, you know, the, this investment you did here or the way you modeled this, it really made an impact. Um, and I share this because I think there's a lot of you in the seats this morning that you feel that tiredness for doing good. But I wanna encourage you to trust what Peter says. He says, you have the attention of the Lord. You have the attention of others. And if you don't grow tired in doing good, you will reap a harvest in due time. So what does it look like to suffer for doing good? And I think Peter describes this at the very beginning of that passage we read. He gives us five things. He says, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, and be humble. And it might seem like these are five just kind of random virtues that Peter threw out there, but they're actually all things that stem 
from the same idea. You can kind of uh, picture them as, as five fingers on the same hand. And the way they're all related is that they all are extending grace. Extending grace. But that's not easy, is it? And no one knows the concept and how challenging suffering is more than the author of this letter. Peter was the one who could not understand the concept of the Messiah suffering. There's a passage in Mark, and when we look at this, it's a, it's a conversation between Peter and Jesus and the disciples. And Mark chapter eight, it says, he, who's Jesus, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And then Peter takes him aside and began to rebuke him. He's like, Jesus, you can't suffer like that. It just doesn't make any sense. But then Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then not long after that, Jesus is arrested and Peter is found waiting in the shadows of the courtyard of the high priest's house while Jesus is being examined. And then Peter denies Jesus for the third time. And he just swears fearfully that he's not a disciple of Christ. He doesn't, doesn't know him, he wasn't with him, wants nothing to do with him because Peter knows the suffering that he will face if he acknowledges being a follower and he avoids it at all cost. Now fast forward to chapter five in the book of Acts. Peter's no longer huddled in the shadows of the outer courtyard. In fact, he's the one who is now the accused. He stands before the same tribunal that examined Jesus and the same man who feared being confronted by a maidservant now confronts the high court and he refuses their order to be silent and proclaims the gospel boldly, knowing very well the persecution that this will lead to. And so what changed for Peter when, when he denied Jesus to boldly proclaiming the gospel? And the thing that happened in between those two moments was the cross. Peter saw his Messiah die on the cross. Jesus sets the example for suffering for doing good. And when you experience what Christ did on the cross, it changes everything. So not long ago, um, we had plans to get together with a group of people. And uh, I knew I was gonna see a person in that group who had said some hurtful things towards a friend of mine. And I was having a hard time with this. And if you know anything about me, um, I have a really hard time when things seem unfair. And Amy has a nickname for me, she'll call me Even Steven. So if I see something that's unfair, I, I, I wanna fix it, I, I wanna change it. And she'll just be like, settle down, Even Steven, it'll be okay. And so I was, I was driving home and I can remember thinking about this person and I just had these thoughts come up in my mind, all these passive aggressive thoughts of things that I could say to try to get back at them and make things right. And then I felt convicted. And I was like, okay, Lord. And I, and I just started praying, Lord, could you help me? <clears throat> could you help me to be more compassionate, more humble? Help me to love this person. And I, and I was just... I kept asking the Lord over and over, help me to be better at this. And honestly, not a lot was changing in my heart. And then the Lord directed my thoughts towards the grace that he has extended towards me. And the more I thought about how much the Lord has forgiven me and how he just so gently brings me back when I get off track, suddenly this, this resentment I was holding on to just kind of it seems so trivial. It just, just fell away. And when you, when you experience God's grace, that's what happens. And so if you have the choice to try to just be hard, be, try harder at these things that, that Peter lists here, 
being like-minded, sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, and be humble. If you just try harder, it doesn't always work. But when we focus on God's grace, then we see a difference. So trying harder at these things isn't what's going to enable you to suffer for doing good. Experience and reflecting on God's grace is. So if the, you have the option of choosing this or spending time with Jesus, spend time with Jesus. Because these are more of a byproduct of spending time with Jesus. I wanna invite the worship team to come back out. So the good news is, is that we don't live in a time where we face the type of persecution, at least here where we live, that, that these first centuries Christians face. However, we do live in a world that is really angry and full of rants, quick to repay evil with evil and insult for insult. Uh, last November, uh, Amy and I upgraded our iPhones and it had been quite some time since we did that. And so they said, you know what, there's a newer plan that you can get and it's gonna save you some money. So we did that. And when we got our first bill back, they had messed up something in the system. So our, our phones were on different, two different plans instead of just a newer plan. And this, this ended up being a lot more expensive. It was an extra $50 a month. And so I had to call up and you guys know how this works. It, it, takes a while, you're on hold before someone answers, and then you have to get transferred three or four times before you get the right department, and you have to explain everything, and it's just a hassle, right? And so I talk to someone, and they're like, okay, here's the problem, we'll fix it. When you get the next billing cycle, we can reimburse you the $50. So this goes on literally for six months. Every month I get back, my bill's still wrong, and I have to call, and it's over an hour every time. And one of the last calls I made, just before we finished, before the customer service person hung up, they said, I just wanna tell you, you're the most humble and kind person I've talked with. And now I, I don't share this so you guys think, wow, when it comes to wireless customer service representatives, Pastor Steve is so kind and humble. I mean, and honestly, I didn't do anything special. I think I basically just didn't yell at them. And I thought, you know, if, if just not yelling at someone goes that noticed because our world is so angry, imagine if we suffer for doing good. Imagine if they see something where it actually brings harm to us, but we're willing to do that because we know in that moment, they're gonna experience God's grace. Imagine the impact that they can have. And so our world is angry, quick to yell. We repay evil with evil. But Peter says, be different. People notice, suffer for doing good. And Peter says, even if, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And I believe that Jesus can change you're even Stephen into even if. I just wanna end with this question. Does the way I respond to people who inconvenience me, or I might even consider them enemies, does it look like more like repaying evil for evil or extending grace? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you showed us grace, Lord. And honestly, this isn't easy. This is counterintuitive for us to actually choose to suffer. But Lord, help us just remember what you did for us so that we can bring your grace into the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen.